Okay, here. Uh, Sabrina Gomez, not here. Ruben Macarena, not here. Absent, absent. Uh, Alice Lopez. Here. John Vasquez. Here. And myself. <coughs> uh, if we could please stand for the flag salute. If our pharmaceutical students can lead us on the pledge, please. We'll wait for the Pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's give our seniors a big round of applause. <laughs> Four point oh adoption of the agenda with the uh, addendums to the agenda items uh, fifteen point two and twelve point one. Move. Alice Lopez. Second. John Vasquez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Three. Oh. Five point oh. Oh, Mr. Macarino's here. Okay. Let's let you get settled there, really. Okay, uh, uh, do we need an interpreter? Anybody need an interpreter? Or sign language? No? We're good? Yes, I know we don't have Okay, we're at uh, 5.0, consent calendar. Okay, uh, 5.1, approval of regular board meeting minutes for October 10th, 2023. Move. Second. Vasquez, Alice Lopez, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 4-0. 5.2, approval of release warrants dated October 5th, 2023 in the amount of $341,071.40. October 12th in the amount of $644,286.55. Move. Second. Alex Lopez, John Vasquez. All in favor? Aye. 4 0. Oh. 6.0 Award Presentation. 6.1 A Student Board Member Report. Good afternoon. Currently going on at the high school is Red Ribbon Week, and to celebrate there is a dress up week. On Monday was Neon Day, today was PG Day, tomorrow is Aztec Gear, on Thursday is Senior Dress Like Teachers and Teachers Dress Like Students, and Friday we wear our Halloween costumes. Moving on to sports, tonight we have our first playoff game from our Lady Aztecs volleyball team. On Thursday we have our water polo game at Granite Hills, and on Friday we have our last home football game, and it's Senior Night for both football and cheerleaders. And lastly, on Saturday, Saturday, we have a cross-country meet at John Seaman Invitational coming up. It's our 8th grade invasion on November 8th, and that's all the news I have for you guys tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 8.0, public comments. Uh, members of the public may address <coughs> the board on any agenda item or other item of interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board before or during the governing board's consideration of the item. The board is not able to discuss or take action on any item not appearing on the agenda. Pursuit to board policy, the board may limit individual comments to no more than three minutes, individual topics to 20 minutes. Please begin your comments by stating your name. Yeah, the board asks that during public comment, everyone be respectful of the speakers. Members of the public shall not interrupt or interject while another person is giving their public comment at the podium. During public comment, there shall be no use of foul language. Should a member of the public have a concern about a specific employee, we ask that you direct these concerns to me, the superintendent, after this meeting so that we can address those concerns and have them handled through a proper procedure. Please do not use employer or student names during public comment. At this time, we have a few cards. We have three cards here. So the first one is Michael Jordan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Jordan. I'm the PE teacher at Farmersville High School. I'm also a, a union rep. 
uh, and I'm here to talk about the district finances and the credit cards. Recently, some coaches were notified that the district credit card usage for van fuel is no longer available to them. The card has been canceled or suspended. Coaches and teachers were told they have to use their own cash or credit card for tra uh, track meets, tournaments, professional development, etc. With inflation and the cost of gas for our own school vans, we're talking hundreds of dollars. <clears throat> Plus, how long does it take um, for the business department to process a claim? One week, two weeks, maybe three with the board approval? We're all aware that the board members attend the CSBA. This year it is being held in San Francisco. Is the board able to use district issued credit cards or is each board member going to foot the bill for his or her own room, the van, gas, plus their meals at San Francisco prices? Are you going to be able to charge $1,000 plus on your personal credit card? Under the superintendent and CBO, our business department staff has doubled. The district office staff has increased all across the board. Yet our own ADA has not now, and it seems, <laughs> Our ADA has not increased, but yet our staff in the district office has, uh, which means it just that's bad. Board members, our students, uh, are the ones who lose out here. No coach or teacher should have to use their own financial resources to cover upfront costs and then wait weeks for a reimbursement. Uh, with, with these kind of endeavors, who's, who's going to want to participate in activities? Who's going to want to coach? Would you? Our business department needs the attitude that it works, it has to work for the students. And we have to start holding people accountable. Um, the superintendent has said he's in charge of personnel, MOT, and the business department. Rumor has it MOT can't buy stuff at various stores like Lowe's or Home Depot. I don't have that verified, but I'm curious. I would hope that you would be too. Thank you. Okay, next we have Arlene Dodge. Hello, my name is Arlene Dodge, and I am a teacher here at DC at Deep Creek Academy. I am reading this letter written by the union. I am reading at the behest of the union. I'm here today to talk <coughs> about district test scores and the district's failure in this effort. Much could be said about district test scores over the last few years, but what never seems to enter any discussion is the rot that has been slowly creeping into the district over the last 10 years from inconsistent leadership at the top and what I'd like to call the three L's, lack of caring, lack of work ethic, and lack of transparency. Let me explain. The majority of our superintendents have come from Los Angeles or far out of town. They did not move to the area and thus on Fridays they hightail it to beat the traffic home. How many have you seen at football games or other athletic events? Not leaving before varsity even starts. How about other evening, weekend student activities? Do they purchase food in town for meals? Support Kiwanis Club? Attend city council meetings? Next, the staff at the district office has nearly doubled in recent years. And yet our ADA stays the same. Each board meeting, another super, supervisory position is hired, adding another layer of directives and bureaucracy to our district. Has there been one pay period since Jonice's retirement without an over or under payment or other financial issue? Yet that department has doubled in size. Our previous superintendent got paid extra for curriculum instruction. Yet that department has now doubled in size with few people actually visiting sites, observing teachers, attending school student functions. How do any of them get to know our students or what they need? Our superintendent tells our government classes at board meetings and assemblies that he is there for them and all of, for all of them. Yet does he spend lunch talking to any students? Seeing them in action, playing games, visiting them during our new pool activities? How many meetings are canceled or does he just not attend like the grievances or the Sunday WASC team kickoff last year? Board policy just got updated at a cost of 8,000 to the district, isn't that his job? Community liaisons will be getting an hours reduction yet our leadership is willing to spend 300,000 of general fund dollars on the firehouse renovation with no input, not to mention the cost after renovating. And only $10,000 for roof repair at the junior high? Meanwhile, we have leaking roofs that need to be completely replaced. What funding, source, what funding sources are listed for new hires or a salary schedule? When recently asked 
by the board. Our superintendent said he did not know, but wasn't it from the general fund? Shouldn't this be listed in the board packet? As a superintendent of a small district, shouldn't he know how a position created by him at the district office is being funded? In summary, no longer do our top uh, leadership wears many hats. They are in a hiring frenzy to do less work, yet site personnel is being cut back. District office staff is manipulating titles and salary schedules to get high percent raises, but bargaining units are being offered the bare minimum. The past raises for teachers was 4.5% and 9%. Yet administrative salary costs raised 19% and 13.8% based on reclassifications and added personnel. So when we talk about test scores, why are we not talking about a lack of leadership from the top while sites and students are left to flounder? Thank you. Next is Berenice Macias. Good evening. Um, as many of you guys know, my name is Bernice Macias, formerly known as Ms. Macias at the junior high site. Um, for those that don't know, I am currently an employee, but I came to talk to you guys as a parent perspective. So I wanted to bring it up, and I don't know if it can be brought up in the next meeting. I've been to the community forums as well. And we were taught a little bit about title funds. In one of the meetings um, for school site council, Mr. Sanchez invited me out to participate as an employee to translate. But there, I realized that he said we no longer have Title I funds. Last year, as a community liaison, I, lo I heard a lot about Title I, Title I, like, hey, we're going to get it from Title I funds. And it was for a lot of like student engagement, parent involvement, and different things like that. Today, I want to bring up um, two things. Why do we not have Title I funds? Why are we one of the schools that don't receive it anymore when, our, when we have a lot of student needs? And the second thing is athletic funds. Um, why is it that we have such a short athletic funds? I don't think it's fair that I'm talking to my kid who finally decided to play a sport, and he's telling me that he received the size small jersey because there was no, no more jerseys, and he's a medium, and he had to switch out with the player that's a large. So I'm like, why are we not treating these kids like good? Why are we not having enough funds? Our, and I'm not bashing our AD because our, our AD is amazing, our principal is amazing. We do a lot of things as much as we can. I'm there. I don't think people know. But even this year, we started selling snacks at the game to try to get like more funding on our own to try to, like, you know. But I feel like coming from a, a parent, a player, a coach, if the kid, kids look good, they feel good. If they feel good, they're going to play good. And to me, it's like they had their first game against Woodlake, and we went over there, and these kids are named brand things. Like, this is another home middle school that has the same population as we do. We're not comparing to Exeter, who a lot of them are um, American, I guess you can say for a proper word. But we're talking about Woodlake, who's a lot of majority population is Hispanic. They're just like us. And they're out there with nice Adidas uniforms, like really looking sharp. And we have some of our kids who we're gonna wear PE shorts. Remind you, their PE shorts are black. And the kids' uniforms are blue, navy blue. So how are you gonna go mismatching with the navy blue shirt, black shorts, and whatever pair of socks they can find? And I don't think that's, that's fair, because I don't think we've noticed that a lot of our, our city, and I'm a proud farmer's villain. Remind you, I was born actually in Lindsay, and I was here from, the, from um, zero all the way till now that I'm 27, I believe. And I've like went to, <laughs> I, I forget my age sometimes, even though I'm young. Well, I think I'm young, right? But I, I attended, I'm a, I'm a farmer's well alumni <coughs> here. I, I've been here, I haven't left here, and I'm just trying to like, like power up our, our city. And I don't think we noticed because I was driving around farmers well and like they're tagged up. Like it's tagged up. Like, it has not been like that in forever. And it's like, why? Because sometimes these kids, we drop them. We unfortunately, we drop them. I've seen it here where like we lose our kids by the time they go to high school because they're already been so forgotten that by the time that we try to reach out to them as they're older, it's too late. And I'm sorry if it's too late. But one of the things is like, what do we have to offer them? What, what is it that we don't have? I think that kids are just like adults. If you want somebody, you know, adults work for money, obviously. So if you're going to say, like, hey, 
we'll pay you overtime. You know, that's a great incentive for us. We're like, oh, shoot, like, I don't want to do it. But for the extra money that, you know, I can buy this, this. Same thing with the kid. Why can't we put off her? I'm like, hey, um, here, we're going to get you a trip. You like snacks? All right, if you come to tutoring and we do this to, like, um, score your grades, like, you can win this and this and this. And I feel like that's what we need to do to, like, better our test scores. But we need money for that. And there is, like, inflation is super high right now. Like, for back-to-school shopping, I spent a lot. Like, I spent a lot. So I can only imagine what a uniform with print, like, will cost. And there's no funding for that. There, there, I, I don't see it. Like, we met. We try to, like, you know, Mr. Sanchez is the type of person that does not say no. He's the type of person, like, okay, we'll come back and we'll see where we can find that money, where we can pull that money from. But unfortunately, if it's not there, what can we do? And I want to share a quick stat with you. Obviously, this is already from an employee side, but did you guys know that we received 169 students received an award this Monday that was that have over 95% attendance rate and a 3.0? If you do the math, that's about 43%, 44% of our population. Dude, that's almost half. And that's like a big thing. And I really wish that these kids can like be celebrated with like a pizza party or like something to be like, hey, you know what? Next, next, next semester, how we're we gonna do this? Like we're gonna get the 60% of population and then we're gonna get the 70% and then eventually like aim to 100%. But some of these kids lose the motivation because they're just like, and? And same thing with my kid. Like I don't want my kid to be discouraged like when they go and play, like because the kids talk. If us adults talk, the kids talk too. And they go to compete with other schools and they're not dressed properly or they're not looking as sharp. And like I said, if we're comparing ourselves, we're not comparing ourselves to a school. We're comparing to the same people that have the same ethnicity as us and they're looking sharp. So why can't we as a junior high or even as Farmersville look sharp against them and be like, you know what, we are a match. Because our kids are good. I'll have you know that they, they win. They win the games. Right now we're on playoffs, right? So. Why can't we award them and be like, you know what, just how you play, you can be dressed like that, you know, to motivate them longer. So I'm really hoping that we consider giving more funds to middle school, to anybody at least that participates in these events and go and compete other schools to let them know that Farmersville is not there to play. All right, that concludes public comment. Yeah, 8.0, uh, superintendent comment. I'll reserve most of my comments when I give the presentation based on the SPAC data that came out. But I just want to just again thank our wonderful seniors for being here and for being present. I look forward to you to continue to come to the meetings and to also speak. We want to hear your voice and see how it is that you are doing, how we are doing, how everything is coming along for you and preparing you for the future. So, thank you. 10.0, uh, uh, Kate, eight issues. Uh, 10.1, approval of, of donation of churros, uh, super spottles to Snowden Elementary ASB account. Second. Ruben? Ellis. Ellis? And John Vasquez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 4 0. Uh, 10.2, approval of new professional institute conference on November 7th through the 8th, 2023, in Fresno, California. Move. Second. Lopez, John Vasquez, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 4-0. Uh, 10.3, approval of uh, theater arts class to Roger Rockets Dinner Playhouse on November 18th, 2023 in Fresno, California. Move. Second. Lopez, Ruben? Mm -hmm. Macarena, all in favor? Aye. 4-0. Uh, 10.4, approval of San Joaquin Valley a San Joaquin Regional Meeting and Roadshow on November 17th through the 18th, 2023 at uh, Tayani Lodge. Move. Alice Lopez. That's it. Druid Macarino, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 4-0. 11.0 high school issues. 11.1 .1, approval of donation from JL Bodega to Deep Creek Academy Student Leadership. Move. Alice Lopez. Second. John Vasquez, all in favor? Aye. 4-0. 11.2, approval of donation from J.L. Bodega, <coughs> Deep Creek Academy, student leadership. Oh, is that the same Ooh. thing? Uh, I thought, but no. 
Two different amounts. Okay. Second. Thomas Lopez, John Vasquez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Four oh. Eleven point three donation from Marbleria. Uh, Mer How do you say? Marbleria. Marbleria, Los Altos to Deep Creek Academy and Student Leadership. Move. Alves Lopez. Second. Ruben Macarino. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh oh. Eleven point four approval of donation from Sam's Foods Supermarket to Deep Creek Academy and Student Leadership. Move. Alves Lopez. Second. Ruben Macarino, all in favor? Aye. Aye. 4-0. 12.0, curriculum. 12.1, approval of expanded learning opportunity program, ELOP. Move. Alice Lopez? Second. John Vasquez, all in favor? Aye. 4-0. 12.2, approval of agreement with California Teaching Fellows Foundation for winter and spring expanded learning programs. Alice Lopez? Second. Ruben Macarino, all in favor? Aye. 4-0. A 13.0 personnel. A 13.1 approval of certificated personnel, item 13.1.1. Ruben Macarino? Second. John Vasquez, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. 3-1. A 13.2, approval of classified personnel, item 13.2.1 through item 13.2.4. Move. Alice Lopez? Second. Ruben Macarino, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 4-0. 13.3, personnel action report, information only. 14.0, uh, board business. 14.1, uh, consideration of any any item any member of the board wishes to have on future agendas or provide a written update. Uh, Ruben Macarino? Uh, nothing, but I do want to thank Snowden School for the t shirt and the backpack. I love it today. I like to promote the school, so but I'm not sure that's appropriate to say now, but I want the opportunity to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Alice? I want to see on the next agenda that uh, the issue with the credit cards have been um, fixed and that um, we are not having to reimburse. I don't think anybody should do out of pocket. And if there are certain people that are not submitting their invoices on time, then those are the people that need to be, you know, not permitted to do it. But other than that, there should be no reason to. Mm -hmm. Do out of pocket. Uh, John? Nothing at this time. Uh, I'm on the same uh, boat with uh, Alice. And uh, is there some reason why we can't allow uh, cards for these sites and the, they take care of it on site? Is there an accounting issue with that? To having the sites, Jason? Card, one credit card per site to take care of that? You can't, you can't discuss that right now. No, that's a question. It has to be an agenda item. <laughs> okay, so we'll have it on the agenda for next, we'll next meeting. Please have that question uh, answered, please. Okay, uh, 15.0, uh, business services. 15.1, uh, response to district uh, requests for the qualifications for the RFQ, architectural services. A motion for uh, discussion. A second for John discussion. Vasquez, Alice Lopez. Okay. Superintendent, is there any way that we can continue going out and see if we can find any more besides the two that we have? Yeah, we is can. Is there something that we have to do immediately? Okay, no. I will. I would like for you. I would like to request that we continue and put another RFP out there for yes, for so more. Yes, so there's nothing that we have to do um, immediately. So if the board would like that, yes. We can the RFP again and see if we get more responses. Is that what the board would like? I would request okay. that. Okay. All right. Alex, you had a question? Well, we had it on for discussion, and I just um, know that integrated designs had a lower cost for personnel, so I wouldn't want to pay more cost for personnel, which would increase our price. So 
if it's nothing that we're pending building immediately, yes, we should uh, wait and see if we can get other proposals. Mm -hmm. We can put it out again. Can we table? Yeah, so uh, John Vasquez made a motion. Alice, for a second for discussion. John, you want to? Uh, motion to table. Motion to table. Second. All right, good. All right, thank you. Uh, 50.2, okay, well, that's approval of architecture agreement for expanded learning opportunity, ELOP modular building. Motion for discussion? Yeah, go ahead. John? Are you moving for discussion? I'm moving for discussion. John yeah. is Second for discussion. Okay. Questions on that? Go ahead, Alice. Uh, yes, being that it was never um, originally brought before the board to discuss where and when this modular would be built, um, and if we did discuss it, I don't believe it was so close to um, the Hester. I thought we were going to think about this once the bus barn was moved and utilize that area. So um, that's one thing. The other thing is I don't understand why it would just be at Hester versus any other site where also they have um, the after school program. Okay, I can answer. John, Those. any questions? That's it. So, yeah, with regard to the timeliness, this was supposed to have been submitted a while back, but. Um, the person in charge did not submit the while back. That's why it was brought in now because since that individual is not here right now, so we want to make sure this move forward. The reason for the timeline piece is that it's being paid for with ELOP money, which is very, very specific for the after school program. And that particular grant uh, needs to be expended by June 2024. And the reason why uh, we are proposing Hester is after a discussion with the uh, ELOP coordinator, that's where she saw, it was asked of her to where would she would like to pursue it, and she had recommended Hester. If um, it's up to the board if we need to bring it back and, and discuss other potential sites, but that was upon her request. Right now, the ELOP at the junior high school, is that, or where? Right now, the ELOP is, well, they're based here, but they have that settings at each of the sites. This would be to get additional classrooms. My understanding is that she had shared that her largest percentage is that with the little ones. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. More need to this there. So it was based on, on their proposal. So basically, we're moving forward their proposal. It should have been proposed a while back. And for that, you know, we thought it was, but it was not as explained in the weekly bulletin. Uh, question then, if the money's not spent by June. We June, have to give it back. We lose the money. And that's very specific money that can be used, cannot be used for other things. To be very honest with you, I don't like the design on it. Second of all, I think they can do more to it. Second, because of the fact that I want to look at to see if we can get another architect on board besides what we have now, and the money that they're mentioning, I just, I mean, I'm just real confused over that. So I, me, I would like to table and bring it back again next month. That's the decision of the board. It is. That's my request. So a motion by John Vasquez. Can we also? Uh look at what better placement there could be <coughs> when it comes back. Okay, so you want to, uh, one, table it, you want to go into redesign in it, and you want to possibly relocate it. 
see what else is available. Do you have a recommendation of a site, Ms. Lopez? No. No. Well, I think we're in that. It's actually pretty good because by a parking lot, it's right. If you have the half school students, you have parents pick up, you know, right in there so going into campus. Um, but if there's a, an alternative, and, uh, that'd be great too. But I mean, just looking at the plan, it looks appropriate if it's good for picking textures. If I'm not mistaken, this design, Jason, is from Integrated Design? Um, yes, it is from Integrated Design. Mm -hmm. And just uh, so we're going from, in a sense, design, we have a, just a little piece of files with Integrated Design, so we can learn about architects. Mm -hmm. And so for any specific question, I'm sure Mr. Ceballos could probably answer. Is he here? Yes, he's right here. Ah, oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, would you like Mr. Ceballos to address the board? I still like the table. Okay. Well, I would like to hear why he picked the location that he picked. Okay. Well, I, I, don't, I don't believe he's the one to pick the location. I think it was. Well, why is that? Well, he went to go in and, and, and create the design. So yeah, he's a, he was obviously in agreement with the proposal. But yeah. would you like? I mean, he's here now. Yeah. It's in question. Yep. The board member, a board member, is not happy, or perhaps wants alternatives. I'd like to know why this well, particular site. Well, yeah, that would be a different. Or he's an, he's a designer engineer, so the people that uh, suggested the location uh, did the research as to what site would be um, best used, how many more students, okay. um, and that's why it was chosen. So. As far as uh, picking another site, uh, then this is something we go outside of the program uh, to do that. As far as the engineering designing of the, the location, uh, that would be something that we could go back to, if you wish, well, to a different architect. Yeah. The whole thing is that it's a 60 by 40 modular building. Right. It doesn't say how many students it can house. It doesn't say, uh, we, ha we haven't had a discussion as to exactly what what's going to be there, if they're actually, this is all that's going to be there for the after school program or if they're still going to utilize classrooms. So we have not had that discussion to know exactly um, yeah, well, we, what's being done. We could actually discuss that now, Dr. Charles, if you have the information concerning that. Uh, I don't have all of the information, but at least part of the information could be provided by Mr. Felipe right now at least to answer your questions. It still doesn't impact whatever you decide yeah. to do. Uh, I think I would like for you to answer a few questions concerning capacity and things of that nature. Okay, do you want to go up to the podium? <coughs> so I guess yes, David. part of the question, huh? I'm just discussing. No, it's okay. just a, for one, the um, occupancy load. What is the occupancy load on a building of that size? Uh, 40 by 60, I believe uh, it was. And actually, we didn't pick up pick the uh, site Sorry. we because of uh, the the, uh, the timeline to spend the uh, funding okay uh, we were told that you know this fits perfectly because of the proximity to the parking lot mm -hmm. the drop-off area <coughs> and uh, so we were you know quickly put together the uh, proposal because of the urgency and um, I don't know exactly the occupancy law for 40 by 60, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's, um, if I remember correctly, it's 25, not including the uh, instructors, 25 kids. Okay. Well, that's basically all he can answer, so anything else we'd have to have the people that actually uh, recommended the site come in and speak okay so Jason do you have any information from the program or we wait till next meeting yeah, I don't have anything in this office, which is probably okay. yeah, maybe uh, have them come in That'd be all right okay. so if you can make a note of that Jason. time all right thank you, thank you. Okay, so we're going to uh, table for the next meeting okay uh, 15.3 approval of uh, budget revision number one Move. Uh, Lopez. Second. John Vasquez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Uh, 15.4, Farmsville Unified Facility Project Discussion. Jason, can you come and, do you have the, the projects with you? Yes. The list, okay. So, uh, what, oh, would it be okay? No, that's, that's not it. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. I think Chris set it up to take a look at it here on the screen so we could all be on the same page. There you go. And I don't have my, my pointer here, so, but at least they're numbered. So, um, what I tried to do here is I went through all of the existing projects that I knew of and identified them, you know, and numbered them um, by project, essentially. Uh, the second column over, you'll see that's listed there that I did it by funding source. Uh, the third column over, or maybe fourth column, excuse me, is, is like a, a rough estimate of the status of the project. And the last column over is the projected total cost that we know right now. And once again, a lot of these are estimates. So the first project that we're looking at here is the Hester TKK classroom project. And that's, at, um, once again, that's at Hester. Uh, we got a specific grant for that last year, and so right now um, we are in the design phases with that. Um, I believe that is currently at DSA, and they're being and that's being reviewed. So, but the total cost of that project is just sl just shortly shy of nine million dollars. And so, once again, for the most part, almost all of these are estimates. So that's our first project. So the second project was the Hester Cafeteria um, HVAC project. That is. Uh, was funded by Essers too. I think we're just waiting on the final inspection, but from what I've heard, for all, for all intents and purposes, that project is done. That was about 225000 For the third project, uh, it's Snowden Cafeteria HVAC project, so basically similar to Hester. Uh, once again, that was funded with Essers II. Uh, once again, that one's final, that's pending final inspection, but for all intents and purposes, that, that project is done as well. That one comes in at about 246000 uh, number four here is we have the high school shade structure welding booth. Um, and also, I believe that it's concrete pad. It's kind of cut out there. I apologize for that. But that project is to be funded out of LCAP, so th that's listed in the LCAP. Uh, that one's currently pending. Um, we're estimating that to be about $639,000. Um, I will be bringing that back to the board so the board can uh, see the architect agreement on that as well at the next meeting. Uh, number five is the FHS Chiller Project. So the board's probably aware for the past couple years, believe it or not, we've been working on this, this Chiller Project. That is to be funded out of Essers II as well. Um, that one's still pending. Uh, believe it or not, we are waiting for, uh, the contractor is waiting to basically receive the rest of the equipment so it can be installed. That has been a major hurdle on this project due to the various supply chain issues and uh, you know, companies not being able to deliver equipment on time that has severely impacted the timeline on this project. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're still working on it. The estimated costs on that one are just a little bit shy of $3.5 million. Once again, that's to be funded out of Essers II. Number six is the district marquees. Uh, there's funding for that allocated in the LCAP. Uh, that one's currently pending. Uh, we've reached out to a company that does uh, marquees and we're getting pricing on those. Um, but right now we're looking at, you know, close to $350,000 for that project, and that one would be funded out of, out of the LCAP. Number seven, we have the new, new property parking lot, which basically, yeah, that's gonna go on the new property that the district bought over there on Caldwell. So we will need to put down a parking lot because after the parking lot, that's where a lot of the solar arrays are gonna go. And so the parking lot has to be installed prior to the solar arrays going down. But nonetheless, uh, that's number seven. So the funding for that is, fu is coming out of Fund 403B. Now, Fund 403B is the fund that uh, the board set up a couple years ago. Uh, and you may recall when the board um, basically passed a resolution to move $2 million out of the general fund to uh, fund, for, fund 403 for future, for future capital projects. So this is where the money went. And so this is where we're intending on spending the money out of to afford the new, uh, the new parking lot over there. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, it's my understanding that is at DSA for a review as well. 
Uh, number eight is the ELOP after school uh, classroom project, and that's to be funded out of ELOP. Um, once again, that one's a little bit time sensitive only because there's ELOP funding that is carryover funding. And like Dr. Chavez mentioned, that we have to spend this carryover funding by 6.30.24, otherwise we lose it. So nonetheless, um, that's, that's the agreement that the board saw tonight. Mm -hmm. But we're estimating that project to come in at about $2 million. And once again, that would be paid out of the, the ELOP carryover. Mm -hmm. Number nine, that's the uh, potential old firehouse renovation. Um, that would be funded out of the LCAP. So once again, there's, there was funding set aside in the LCAP for this project. Um, currently, um, as the board is aware, you know, the board has approved a purchase and sale agreement. So the property is in escrow. Um, it's my understanding in speaking with our legal counsel that he's hopeful that escrow would close mid-November. So we'll keep the board apprised of that status. But nonetheless, um, the purchase price is not the issue. Um, so it's currently in escrow, but we're estimating the renovation costs may come in about 300000 So once again, that is an estimation that we have listed there. Uh, number 10, um, I was told there was a need for a Farmersville High School bell and paging system. Uh, the cost for that would be out of the general fund. So that, that one's currently pending. I know that there were some quotes obtained on that, but there's been no further action at this point. So that's why I have that listed. It's just a little bit shy of 200000 for a new uh, bell and paging system at the high school. Uh, number 11, that is the Freedom Solar Panel Repair. Uh, that's to be funded out of the general fund. Um, the board may recall that currently we have a, a solar array back behind Freedom over here that's currently not functioning. And so basically, since we've invested all this money to get that solar array up, uh, we think it's advantageous that we have it repaired so it can once again start generating credits that would basically hit our account and basically give us credits for the, for the energy that it would produce. Currently, it's not working. So the quotes we've got basically come in at about 200,000 to repair the, the solar array back over here behind, uh, behind Freedom. And once again, that would be a general fund expense. Number 12, uh, the Freedom well. Uh, I believe, it's, I was told too that the well at the high school basically ran dry for all intents and purposes. And so some research was done. They determined that the best place to locate a replacement well was over here at Freedom. So quotes were obtained, it was, the costs were looked into, and it looked like the Freedom well, uh, well, so it did go out to bid. Uh, we didn't receive any bidders, so I'll be bringing, bringing something back to the board next meeting on that. But at the time that I did this, we were estimating the cost to be about 150. We just got some more information today. That said, the cost would probably look like about 150. And once again, I'm, work, I'm finishing that one up and I'll bring that back to the board for the next meeting. But once again, that would be another cost to the general fund. Uh, number, I think that's where I left off. Number 13, uh, the Farmersville High School uh, Cafeteria HVAC. The board may recall a couple of meetings ago, um, you approved uh, you know, an agreement with American Air to basically install HVAC over at the cafeteria there at the high school. Uh, that is to be funded out of the general fund. Uh, they're estimated to complete that June of 24, and that's going to come in at about 477,000. A high school fire alarm system, uh, that would be funded out of the general fund. Uh, currently, there's some repairs that need to happen at the, high school at, the, at the high school for the fire alarm to get it functioning. And the costs that were quoted to get it up and running again were about 100,000. So that's the estimate that I put in on that line as well. And number 15, district, district, ride, district wide roof leaks. Um, once again, that to be, has to be funded out of the general fund. Um, the, co the costs for that are, I was estimating $10,000. This, you know, this is kind of a moving target. Um, I know that our maintenance department is working on it as it is. You know, I don't know the total cost just yet because they're currently working on it, but I wanted just to put it in here so the board could be aware that this is another project um, that, that we are doing, but nonetheless is costing uh, the general fund uh, some money for that. So that is basically all of the items that I'm aware of right now that are currently out there. So, but when, what I want to point out to the board is, oh, is this showing up here? Yeah. Is the way this is organized is I have from like basically items, whoops, items 10 down to here. So this, these are all projects that basically are to be funded with the general fund. Those come to a total down here about 
about this one one million eighty six thousand. So that's kind of what we're looking at as far as expenses to come out of the general fund. I would say the only one that is really could probably be eliminated would be probably be number ten, uh, the high school bell and paging system, uh, just because it sounds like I mean that amongst all these other things can probably be looked at a little bit later, but. You know, after going over this with different members in cabinet and Dr. Chavez, it seems like the rest of these probably have, um, you know, basically are in process or need to be done within the next, you know, within this fiscal year, so we can take care of the the repairs that need to that need to happen. But in total, all of these, including everything, we're looking at about 18.7 million, but just items 10 through 15. We're estimating that will come in about a million. And once again, those would be costs to the, to the general fund. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Ruben? Alice? Are you doing these um, by priority? Uh, because I do see that, you know, Bell and Paging System, I believe, would be a priority in case of uh, any issues. Uh, the fire alarm would be a safety issue. So I think, um, you know, roof leaks definitely, uh, but when it comes to, um, you know, the safety of everyone involved, we need to move these up on a priority list. Yeah. And, and just if I can just clarify my statement here, at least for items 10 through 15, I wasn't organizing those in terms yeah. of priority. I was just lumping yeah, those all together so we can, okay i just want to make sure that there is some type of priority list and those are not put to the bottom under you know parking lot or whatever we need to make sure that the paging system is working because that's how they contact whoever they need to contact we need to make sure that the fire alarm is working otherwise we could have dangerous situation and roof leaks we don't want anyone getting sick and whatever so um, yes priority list i know that's that's not what's here but we need to focus on, on those, please. John? Nothing right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. 16.0, other business. 16.1, uh, presentation for the 2022-2023 CASP LPAC summary. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, board. As is customary, right after the SPAC data is released, is my duty to present that to the board and to the public as to what, where we are with regards to SPAC and LPAC. So with that said, let's go ahead and begin. I just wanted to frame it for a position of no shame, no blame, no excuses. It's not an issue of shaming anybody or blaming anybody, but we do have to look at the raw data and so we can make next steps and decisions. Okay. The CAST uh, data was from that particular website, so people are welcome to go and visit. It is public information. It's not quite on the dashboard yet. It'll be on the dashboard in November, so that way we are aware of that. So this is on the CASP website. Okay, so let's get to it. So this is where we're at uh, school-wide for all students. In the area of English language arts, we had 21.19% uh, that either met or exceeded standard. We had, yeah, so it's, we had over 50% that did not, and then we have another percentage of nearly met, 23.41 in ELA. So 
You know, that's and that's district wide. I didn't break it down by grade level. I could if the board were to request in a future session, but for the sake of time, I wanted to focus on <coughs> district wide. In the area of mathematics, 12.75 percent of our students met or exceeded standard. Uh, the vast majority did not meet standard. So there are four ways of grading based on SBAC. One is standard not met. One is standard nearly met, which is in yellow. Then standard met is in green, and standard exceeded is in blue. So as you can see, the, the colors speak pretty much for themselves. I did disaggregate for English learners because that is our largest subgroup. Our English learners are not faring very well, quite frankly. So in English language arts, only 5.5% of our students uh, met standard or exceeded standard. That means that the vast majority, over 70%, did not meet. And in the area of math, it's, it's not any higher, it's 4.57% standards met, with the vast majority of our students not meeting standard. So this is a very important uh, data point that we need to be very conscious of. With regards to our students with disabilities, the data is even more telling. Only 1.96 of our students with disabilities met or exceeded standard. That means that 98% did not. And 1.9% of our students met or exceeded standard in mathematics. So that's, those are our two largest subgroups. And those are the ones that we are measured by, by the state and the county. So those are the ones we have to monitor closely. I did want to do some comparison. So in the county of Tulare, overall as a county, we had 34.34% .34 standards met or exceeded in language arts, and 20.31 standard met or exceeded in mathematics. So it does kind of frame it. It is something that is impacting the entire county of Tulare. Um, but I don't, at, at any time, under the, the mantra of no excuses, I'm not making an excuse that because they're all so low that it's okay. We have to always look within ourselves of how it is that we can improve uh, within ourselves as a district. But it is important to get and frame it within how we're doing with the county. And with the state, in the state of California, 46.66% uh, of our students uh, met or exceeded standard in language arts, and 34.62 met or exceeded standard in mathematics. So out of the two, mathematics appears to be the greatest challenge for all schools in California. So our school is, and our districts is, is no exception. So, with regards to California and language arts, we're about 25 percentage points, a little over, below California, and 21.81 percentage points below in math. Uh, but we are closer in range with the rest of the county of Tulare. So we're 13.15 percent below in language arts, and 7.56 below mathematics to the county of Tulare. So it is a regional issue as well as a district issue. So I went in and I looked at previous years because we want to always make sure <clears throat> if this is because of COVID or exactly what it is the root cause and we need to be able to, if we're to address uh, the issues, then, then we have to make sure that we take a look uh, before and after COVID. So first we'll look at 
ELA. This is for all students. And it goes all the way back to 2017-18. And we skipped the year of COVID. So it is relatively consistent, uh, give or take a little bit. It's relatively consistent. So it's an issue that's been ongoing. It's not something that's new. It's not a new phenomenon. It is something that's been ongoing in, in our district. And so the challenges are there in order to be able to address, especially in reducing the red, which is what we don't want. That's the standards not met. This is for ELA for all students. This is ELA for our English learners, which we have about 1,000 English learners in our district of 2,400. So it's almost half of our population uh, really struggling in language arts. In 2017-18, way before the pandemic, it was actually higher levels of red. Um, but we went down a little bit last year and went back up again this past year. So that's a visual. In mathematics, district-wide, uh, 2021 was the most severe, but this last year was a little better with regards, but it's an issue that's been also relatively consistent throughout. That's for all of our students, all 2,400 of them, with the exception of K1 and 2, because they don't test. Okay, So this is how they are faring and how they fared even before COVID. And this is a one for ELs for math. Some may argue that they are dying on the vine. They're really hurting in the area of mathematics, a lot of our English learners. So we definitely have our work cut out for us as a district to try to make a difference. That's SPAC. With regards to LPAC, and that's the number of students that are English learners that take the LPAC exam. That is rated into four areas, level one, level two, level three, and level four. I just wanted to, before I go to that slide, students need to be level four in order to take the very first step towards reclassification. So if they don't have a level four, they can't reclassify. So our pool, this impacts our reclassification data. So our pool of students that we can even pull from has to come from the students that score initially a level four on the, on the summative LPAC. And this past assessment, 13.62 uh, of all of our English learners scored a level four. So out of that 13%, which 13% of 1,000 is about 130 kids, is the pool that we have to, to go ahead and move forward and get them reclassified. Mm -hmm. So from there, it, it includes the teacher's uh, backup, that's important, the parent input, and also additional uh, supporting assessments, like the benchmarks that the students take. So those are the other three criteria utilized in order to determine students that reclassify. Why is it important to reclassify our English learners? Well, all the research shows um, that reclassified students do even better than English-only kids. So they do a lot better. So I stand corrected. This is 15.31 for this past year. It's the previous year that was 13.62. So we did see some growth. I didn't go back any further, but the previous year, um, which is what, 1920 or 2021, the percentage was 6%. Uh, when I went back to 1718, it was over 20%. So it, there is past practice that we're able to get past the 20%. So it's been done before, it can be done again. So we're marching our way back up, but we still have a lot of work to do in that area as well. So what? Now what? You know, 
and the, the key thing here is that we need to be the change, all of us, and it takes everybody, classified, certificated parents, uh, district office and the board working together to, to be that change for our students because they depend on us. You guys depend on us to do better so we can prepare you to be better. So it's, that's our commitment. So we can turn around school district data and with, we're high percentage of poverty because everybody says, oh, well, it's because we're poor. So I went there and I looked up Piedmont. Anybody here know Piedmont is a very wealthy district right in the heart of Oakland. So surrounded by poverty, but it's like the first world surrounded by third world. And they're 85% proficient or exceeding, met or exceeding. So that, there is something to say about poverty, but a lot of times it is said that, that when there's high percentage of poverty or high percentage of Latino students or high percentage of emergent bilinguals, that they don't fare well. But I come before you today to share with you three major studies that prove otherwise. So the answer is yes, it can be done. It's been done before and we could do it again. So there's a study that was done in 2006 by the Morrison Institute where it demonstrates that students of those three criterion can actually be successful in academics. The other study is the famous 90-90-90 schools. I don't know if some of you may have been aware of reading that in your, in your graduate courses. That is the, the work of Doug Reeves, who's also very well known in education. He also presents uh, you know, uh, students that are 90% poverty, 90% ethnic minority, and 90% achievement. And then the final one is the Correlation for Effective Schools in, in 1981, which is, also shows that it can be done. And it's part of the Effective Schools movement. And so the first one, the Morrison Institute, what they, what they came out as part of their solutions is one, a disciplined thought. That means clear bottom line, that we have clarity, that we have ongoing assessments that are formative and created by teachers, that we have disciplined people across the board, strong and steady principles at the sites, and collaborative solutions among the staff. And also that we have disciplined action, that we stick to whatever program or plan that we have over time, because change does not happen overnight, and that we, uh, build to suit in order to continue to have acceleration of learning. That's the Morrison. The 90-90-90 schools have the following premises. It's a focus on academic achievement as being the main thing. So that needs to be our main thing if we're going to follow this model. To have clear curriculum choices, frequent assessments. So you start making the correlations there between the different studies that were done at different times. An emphasis on nonfiction writing, what they call writing across the curriculum, nonfiction, because when they get to college, they're going to do much more nonfiction writing, expository text, than they will uh, narrative text. And that we have more collaborative scoring of student work taking place in PLCs. So in the PLCs, we should be looking at student work and see how we can streamline our grading and streamline our interventions. And under the correlates of effective schools, they argue that it's important to have a safe and orderly environment that's critical, that the climate of high expectations for success is relevant and, and seen every day, everywhere, that instructional leadership is portrayed by the principal at the site who's the instructional leader of that site, that we have clear and focused mission, that there's a sense of clarity, that we have the opportunity to learn and that students have enough time on task. That we have frequent monitoring of student progress through the PLC process, and that we have and develop very strong homeschool relations, which is the community relation piece. So those are the three major studies that have shown that students that are 90, 90, 90 schools are able to do that because failure is not an option. So we do have a plan, and our plan is the 12 point academic plan that we put together, which I won't read at all, but it is a, a refocus on the cycle of inquiry, comprehensive understanding of common core standards, 
comprehensive understanding of lesson design and planning, comprehensive understanding of phases of instruction, in-depth understanding of formative assessments, in-depth understanding of professional learning communities, reinventing interventions. So we even change the language and exactly what does that mean. It should not be an assignment for the entire year. It should be much more like a Grand Prix race where they pull over while we change the tires, check the oil, and put them right back on the track. Where we are exploring enrichment, understanding MTSS, creating a vertical alignment between the different schools because we have a very uniquely designed district and uh, that site and district level are monitoring progress for ABA, academics, behavior, and attendance, and that we have strong levels of parent engagement. So based on that, we went out on a limb. We made the following claims. Claim number one, one of our goals is that all high school seniors will graduate with a college and or career pathway. We want all of our seniors to graduate with some kind of future. They might not all choose to go to college, but they all should have some kind of career pathway. Two, all incoming freshmen will be at grade level in reading, writing, and math. That's a tall order, but it can be done. Three, all incoming kindergarten emergent bilinguals, the ones that come to us in kindergarten, should be able to reclassify no later than eighth grade. So in that way, the idea is that the high school, we pivot our focus from having to provide ELD to monitoring. Remember, we have to monitor reclass students for four years anyways. And so it's a change and shift under the mantra of no shame, no blame, no excuses, and a shift from teaching to a shift to learning. So instead of asking, well, we taught it, we have to ask the question, have they learned it? And if not, then we have to reteach or do something different in order to make sure that our students are learning at high levels. And that's my presentation. There is a sense of urgency. It's all hands on deck. But together we can make it happen. So we have to come together to address this need. At the end of the day, that's why we're all here. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Or do you want her to repeat it? No, you want me to start over? <laughs> no. I said I would do the other half in Spanish. Okay. okay. So I'll leave it here, Chris. All right, thank, thank you, everybody. You. I have great respect for our teachers because I know the challenge is great. It's not easy. And I know it's not just Farmingville, I know it's the region. And I, I, I you know, uh, have participated with teachers in trying to get things done. And I see how hard they work and how dedicated they are. I also have great empathy for parents who put the hope on the school to change the way, um, to put that path for their children. They rely on the schools, on their teachers, and they do what they can. If they're economically in a position, they will participate. A lot of our parents don't have those opportunities <coughs> and don't have the ability to even communicate, so they stay away. Some of the support that we get at other school districts is because they have a lot of community support. When the parents here earlier was talking about Whitley, well, they have a Chamber of Commerce, they have a Kiwanis Club, they have other service groups that support their community and their sports. <coughs> they don't have that. So the challenge here is even greater. The expectation here is even greater. I have great hope in our students. I, I believe that they could become whatever they they want to be. We need to be able to provide them the examples and we need to be able to give them the vision and the hope. But we need to give them the skills. So it does take all of us to work together. And being on this board, I have seen the efforts that have been made. You know, um, starting with our superintendent, having the community forum, we never had that before. We never had the ability to have our parents come and actually be heard by the top person at our school. 
and I think that's very important. Of that comes the ability to say, hey, we need a change. We need to, you know, be real with ourselves. In that, um, the idea of a community resource center so that people can actually get help so that economically, the employment may be, or whatever's going on in the family home, so that they can be stronger and better, so that their students can be stronger and better and perform more at school. And um, I think that's so important that we also create more community organizations, which is very tough to do. You know, as I had tried to start a chamber of commerce in this community and people are waiting, they're just, I'd rather wait and see what happens. Well, a lot of times we need to just jump in with our eyes closed and say, okay, we're gonna do it. We're gonna learn in the process of trying to create something strong in this community. There's a lot, a lot that's in the shoulders on this school district. There's a lot that people expect from all of us, from our students, from our teachers, from this board, from our, the staff, and we're just trying to recreate something that's going to be real and effective. At the end of the day, it's about our students. It's about bettering our families. It's about a better community. And it doesn't happen unless we see eye to eye and believe that this can happen. We need to believe that we can achieve. That's so important. Um, being a product of this school district. <laughs> I know what it's like to not have all the resources. And I had to pull myself up and say, okay, it's really up to me now. My parents don't have the time. We, you know, I, some of you probably have big families and um, some of you just don't have the means, but so it's really up to us. Well, at that time, I felt it was up to me. I had a dream big to get out of the farm. And I had to rely on someone to give me that helping hand to move that forward. And my path has been a good one. I've been fortunate to work in Washington, D.C. with congressmen. I've been fortunate to work, have a 20 year plus career at the Los Angeles Times. I had the honor to represent you on this board and on the city council. And I love being a headhunter to find talent so that we could continue to grow. But I would like to say to all of you is that we're all trying, but we also have to try a little harder, right? That's the way you say. For those of us that have moved forward, I congratulate you and I thank you. But we need more. We need more help, not just from our students, not just from the board, not just from our teachers, but from everyone. I believe in this town and I believe in our students. And I wouldn't be on this board if I didn't believe in any of it. I could have easily said, I'm just going to stay in Los Angeles. Uh, but I came back because I believe. And I believe I seen a blank paper. I believe that we can build and I believe we can be strong. It's not a, it, that's a uphill battle, but I think we can find it. And I think we're getting there. But let's work together and let's. The plan that you have, Dr. Chavez, I think is um, it's realistic, it's challenging, it's hard, but if we don't try to reach for the stars, that we perhaps we could get to the horizon. And that's what we get. I just wanted to share that with this board. Mm -hmm. Alice? No, thank oh. you. No, that's thank you, Dr. Chavez. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, let's see, 17.0 uh, future meeting dates, and 17.1, November 14th, 2023, December 12th, 2023, 20.0, uh, adjourned to closed session, it's at 8 p.m., 20.1, uh, 20, 20 conference was labor negotiations, GC 54957.6, it is the intention of the board to meet in closed session to review its position and to instruct its designated reps, agency designated representatives, uh, Dr. Sergio Chavez, Jason Kraft, Manuel Mendez, <laughs> Naval Organization, <coughs> FDA, CSEA, Management. 20.2, Public Employee Discipline, Dismissal Release Complaint, Government Code 54957. 
My 20.3 conference with real property negotiator, government code 54956.8, agency negotiator Brian Martin, attorney AALRR under negotiation price and terms, address 846 North Magnolia, Farmsville, California. Okay. You go to the closed session. Good. Thank you for being questions? here. Thank you. Guys have any quick questions? You're welcome to stay and wait, but we're going to be in there for about another 40 minutes. Yeah. So if you need to go, go ahead. If you can stay, stay. But thank you for coming. Yeah. Very proud of you.
Member of the board to be in closed session to review its position and, and instruct the designated reps, agency designated representatives, Dr. Sergio Chavez, Jason Kraft, Manuel Mendez, name of organization, FTA, CSEA, and management. No answer taken. Uh, 21.2, uh, public employee discipline, dismissal, reduced complaint, government code 54957, no action taken. Uh, 21.3, conference with real property negotiators, uh, government code 54956.8, AC negotiator, Brian Martin, attorney, AALRR, under negotiation price and term, address 846, North Magnolia, Farmsville, California, no action taken. Uh, 22.0 adjournment at 846. Move. House Lopez. Second. Macarena, all in favor? Aye. 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 4 0. All right. Cool. And you as well. Thank you. And Mayor will brief in the morning. Which one?